نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي لله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله ولا تموتون الا وانتم مسلمون My dear brothers and sisters I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger. I come to you today and ask you, what is today? What is today to you? Lots of you might come and say, today is Friday. Some of you might come to say, today is Black Friday. What is Black Friday? Today we can save many dollars on TVs, cameras, game consoles, clothing, whatever it may be. Did you take advantage of that? Did you go wait in line all night to save this money? Did you wake up early? Did you do it before coming to Jum'ah? Are you going to do it after Jum'ah? I'm going to tell you a deal that I just found out. A deal I found out in a book. <coughs> and where was this book? The book was the Quran. And this is a deal that will break any Black Friday deal. Any Black Friday deal. deal. For the people who believe, who do good deeds, what do they get? What is their reward? Is it a TV, a big screen? Is it a game console? No, dear brothers and sisters. It's Jannah, Firdaus al Ala. This is the deal I'm here to talk, talk to you about, dear brothers and sisters. So when I come to you today and tell you what is today, today is an opportunity for you to go to Jannah. Today is an opportunity for you to go to Jannah. And guess what? Allah gives us that opportunity every single day. Every single day. Not just one day out of the year. Not a weekend out of the year. Not on certain holidays. Every single day. So let's take advantage of that today. And how are we going to do that? Well, as you also know, today is the last few days of what? The month of Muharram. The month of Muharram, which is the first month in the Islamic calendar. Have we done anything for this? Did we even notice this? We know when January hits, January 1st hits, what do we do? Everybody decides to have a New Year's resolution. And uh, correct me, I, I mean, it's not haram to have a resolution. We should better ourselves. But what are the resolutions we're going to do usually? To do this, to do that. Most of them are dunya resolutions. I need to drop 50 pounds. I need to do this. I need to do that. Well, what we're going to do, why don't we make resolutions in the Islamic month? Let's better ourselves. For what? The akhirah. Let's better our souls. And how are we going to do that? Let's take the root word of Muharram. Which is what? Haram. And let's avoid the haram, dear brothers and sisters. Let's avoid the haram. Why? So we can attain our goal in this life. And what is our goal? To go back home. And where is home? Jannah. Jannah. So we're going to start this year by having a sinless year. Sinless year. We want to better it from the previous year. And most of you might go like, well, I don't really disobey Allah. Do we know what we're really doing when we're disobeying Allah? Of course, we might not be doing the, the major sins. We might not be doing the big sins. You know, we might be just doing things that we don't realize it. Like in Surah Barah, when it references to the Aqaba, what is your hardship? What is your hurdle, actually? What is the hurdle that you have that's keeping you, you away? Is this hurdle your job? Is your job haram? Or maybe it's halal. But what you're doing at work is haram. You get into a lot of gossip and backbiting and talking this, being negative. Or maybe it's in a relationship you're in. That boyfriend, that girlfriend, whatever you have, you justify it. You say, oh, well, I'm giving da'wah, eventually we're going to get married. Is that relationship the haram? Is that your hurdle? 
that's keeping you from avoiding or disobeying Allah. Just make it halal, dear brothers and sisters. It is not that hard. Or is it a halal relationship you're in? And are you cheating your spouse, your husband, your wife? Wrong. Are you, you being like rude to them or disobeying them or using them just like a servant? Or is it the friends you're around with keeping you in bad company? Whatever the hardship it is, we need to stop it. I mean, whatever the hurdle is, we need to stop it. There's a man who came to Ibrahim, Ibrahim ibn Adham. And he said, Ya Abu Haq, I cannot stop disobeying Allah. I cannot stop disobeying Allah. Please help me. And Ibrahim goes, I'm going to give you five conditions. If you can follow these five conditions, you'll be fine. And the man said, please, tell me what is the first? The first, he said, if you're going to disobey Allah, do not eat from the sustenance he provides you. Do not eat from the sustenance he provides you. And the man said, how can you do that? Allah provides everything. And Ibrahim goes, do you think it's fair that you eat what he's providing you and you disobey him? And the man said, no. What is the second condition? And Ibrahim goes, if you must eat what he provides you and still disobey Allah, then don't do it on the land he owns. Don't do it on the land he owns. And what the man say? The man said, this is harder than the first. And Ibrahim goes, so you think it is right to eat what he provides you and live on his land and still yet disobey him? And the man said, no. Then he said, what is the third condition? And he said, the third condition, if you must eat what he provides you and disobey him on his land, then do it where he cannot see you. Do it where he cannot see you. And the man said, Allah sees everything. He knows what is in our hearts. So he said, what is the fourth condition? He said, well, if you're going to disobey him by eating his sustenance and living on his land and doing it where he can see you, then when the angel of death comes, tell him you need more time. You need more time to repent to him. And the man said, you can't do that. When the time is told, you can't change it. And he said, what is the fifth condition? And he said, that the fifth condition is, if you're living this life of disobeying Allah, when the angels of the hells of the, uh, who cover the gates of the hellfire come to take you, tell them, don't go with them. Refuse to go with them. And the man understood and said, stop, 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 Abu Zhaq. Stop. I understand. I understand what you're getting at. And he repented to Allah. And after he repented to Allah, he lived the rest of his life without disobeying Allah. Dear brothers and sisters, these are lessons we all know, but we forget. The simplicity of this message here, something we all know. But we forget all the time. He's provided us with the hearing, the seeing, the sustenance, but little are we grateful. Little are we grateful. And what do we do with the gratitude? We end up disobeying Him. We disobey Allah with all that He's given us, with what He has given us. <clears throat> so definitely, dear brothers and sisters, let's avoid this. And how are we going to avoid this? The way we're going to avoid this is to come out, and I like using analogies. I use analogies a lot. There's an article I read the other a couple weeks back, a coworker sent it to me, and I thought this is a great way to do it. Let's use the analogy. I see everybody here looks somewhat in shape and stuff and probably has worked out before. We will use this analogy like you use the analogy of working out, training, going to the gym. Because when you do that, you have a goal. You create a goal, right? It's football season right now. And what's every football team's goal? It's to go to the Super Bowl. Do you think they have that goal now? Or do they do it in the off season? And if you don't understand the NFL analogy, how about the World Cup? They're not going to get to the World Cup championship game without what? Doing the qualifiers. And before the qualifiers, what are they doing? They're training together as a team. They've been trying with, since a little kid playing soccer. They don't just show up one day and say, hey, you 11, come on, let's go. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to train to get to that. 
And why are we doing this? Because we say every salah, every salah, every time we read this Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, Iyaka na'bud. Iyaka na'bud. What does that mean? Only you do we worship. Only you do we, do we worship. Can we do that? Can we say that every salah, we say this oath, and yet still disobey Allah? We cannot, dear brothers and sisters. That's like going to tell your husband, your wife, your children, I love you. I love you. And then you go out and you do everything opposite of that love. The way you treat them, the way you act to them. This is what we're doing to Allah when we disobey Him. So like I was saying, let's take the analogy of working out. And the nine very small quick tips I'm going to go over with. First and foremost, have a workout plan. Have a workout plan. You can't just go to the gym, do some curls, do some bench press, and think, hey, I'm going to be an Olympian. Does that work? No. When I do my workouts, I know when I like, end up like, losing weight or getting stronger, whatever it may be, it's when I had a plan, I wrote it down, I followed a program, a regimen. Because when I just go to the gym and do things here and there, nothing happens. I'm just going through the motions. Like some of us end up doing in Salah, we just go through the motions. We fulfilled it, we did our thing, let's go to the next day. No, we should not do that. Have a plan, write it down. Like I said, what is our resolution? To be better Muslims next year. Have a plan with your deen. Decide, this is what I'm going to do. I want to start doing this. I want to start doing that. My son goes to a, a school where you know, he's, he's doing hebs. And he's still way, he's only like eight surahs in. He's a young kid. But how do they do that? Their plan is one ayah a day. One ayah a day. One ayah a day. That's his, his plan. By the end of the week, he usually has a surah memorized. What is your plan? What are you going to do to better yourself? Write it down if you have to. It's a good thing to write down. Your brothers and sisters, if you can move up, please make room for the people on the sides. Just fill in the gaps, inshallah. Also in the back room as well. <clears throat> the second thing to working out, what do they tell you? The first thing they tell you, watch what you eat. Watch the junk food. Correct your diet, right? You could do all the working out in the world. They have a saying, you cannot outwork out a bad diet. You can't out-exercise a bad diet. Meaning, regardless of how much you work out, if you have a bad diet, it's not going to work out. Case in point. So how are we going to do that? Same thing with the deen. You can't out good deed sins. I mean, technically you can. But it's not going to work, dear brothers and sisters. If you keep on sinning and sinning and sinning, your good deeds are going to minimize and minimize and minimize. Eventually, the bad deeds are going to overtake you. And that's all you're going to be doing. Oh, I'm just going to be doing this. That's, you think the shaitan is going to come to you one day and just tell you, hey, look, go out and do this major sin. No. He's going to start with small things, small things here and there. Same thing. So just like your diet, you can't you just do good deeds and think, okay, I can, I can sin as well because I'm doing the good deeds. It doesn't work. Number three, when working out, what do you do before you start workout? You stretch and you warm up. You stretch and you warm up. And what happens if you don't? You end up pulling a muscle. You, a couple weeks ago, about a week before my 40th, uh, me turning 40, my brother told me, come, come play flag football with me. I said, okay. Alhamdulillah, I come, I get there late. I don't stretch out. I walk right into the game. Ten minutes into the game, I tear my calf muscle. You know, tore my meniscus. All this, why? Because I didn't warm up. I didn't prepare. You know, I still think I'm a little kid. I could just start running whenever I want to. Same thing to this deen, dear brothers and sisters. If we do not warm up, before the Salah, before Siyam, whatever we do, what's going to happen? You're just going to give it up. Or you're not going to be focused. You're not going to be focused if you just come in, Allahu Akbar. And go in, finish your Salah and leave. Like literally after Salams, you're out and done. Why? Because you weren't focused. You were going through that motion. It's like going to the gym without working, you know, without a plan. So if you don't warm up, you're just going through the motions. Think before you, you do your first Takbir in Salah. Think who you're going to meet. Ali radiallahu anhu used to, when he made wudu, turn white. Why? Because he knew who he was going to meet. He knew he was going to meet Allah. 
<clears throat> Number four, what do they tell you when you're working out also? Drink plenty of water, stay hydrated. Why? Makes you comfortable. You're not constantly thirsty, you're not constantly like dehydrated. Same thing when we come to our deen, be comfortable. If you're ready to do salah or do something, get in a comfortable state. Wear comfortable clothes, whatever it may be. Or do you want to be in salah and, and, and uh, you know, us bigger guys, we know how it is sometimes if our shirt's a little bit too tight. And every time we do it a court, we're too busy doing this. We're adjusting this. We're doing this. Because we're not comfortable. Number five, do not overtrain, right? You decide this khutbah motivates you. Inshallah, it motivates everybody to change the way they, they're going to live their next year and the rest of their life. So what do you do? You say, you know what? I'm going to wake up. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to do tahajjud, do qiyam, do all this stuff. And you don't ease into it. What happens? That's like overtraining. You're not going to run the 40 under 5 seconds the first time you run it. You have to train to get up to that. You're not going to bench 300 pounds just going to the gym one time, two times. You have to have a plan. And same thing with this deen, you have to have a plan. If this is the only salah you make a week, what your plan should be? To pray your daily prayers. To pray your daily prayers, that's all. Don't even throw in sunnah right now. Just make it consistent that you pray your prayers on time. Do your fards. If you already do your fards, add sunnah. You add the sunnah, do your nafil, do these things. Start fasting Monday and Thursday. Do these things, add. Find where you're at and then add to it. But don't do it all at once. <clears throat> Number six, have a workout partner. This, my dear brothers, is very, very, very important. I know this because I'm working out with a, a bunch of brothers right now, Brother Omari, who's leading us. And we're working out together every morning after Fajr. And it makes a huge difference. <laughs> You, the reason why it makes a huge difference is you feel committed to that brotherhood, you're trying to work out together, you're doing things, you motivate each other. If you don't see one guy one day, hey, come on, come on, make it to the gym, come on, we'll see you at the gym tomorrow. Make sure you go to sleep early. There's that motivation. Same thing with this dean, motivate each other. Motivate each other by telling each other, hey, I didn't see you at Fajr yesterday. Why don't you make it to Fajr? Do these things. Hey, look, I want to uh, work. A brother from work the other day, uh, Brother Ziyad, mashallah, he told us, hey look, let's have a group fasting day. Alhamdulillah, I work at a Muslim organization and he got everybody. I wasn't, in all honesty, I wasn't planning on fasting on that Thursday. I wasn't. And I wake up in the morning, my wife actually already packed my lunch. And I grabbed that lunch, I was like, oh, she already made me lunch. But I still decided to fast. I still decided to fast, why? Because I was motivated. I was motivated. I didn't want to be that weak link. So find that partner in this dean. Have a professional coach. Have a professional coach. It's important, because it all starts off with the coach, right? Right now, they're saying, oh, the Redskins are horrible, right? Why? Oh, well, Shanahan, the coach, the coach, the coach. It's always, always about the coach, whoever's teaching you. Same thing with this dean. Go to your local imams. The imams here, you have Imam Jahari, uh, Sheikh Shakir, Hanuti. You have all these tools. Take advantage of them. Go to them. Ask them, how can I do this? How can I implement my plan? Humility. This is something we have a problem with in our deen. Something we have so much pride and arrogance, we can't be humble. Why is that? Oh, I have a beard. This guy doesn't have a beard. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm wearing a scarf. She's not wearing a scarf or this or that, oh I'm uh, following this madhab, he's following that madhab. Humble ourselves dear brothers and sisters. Humble ourselves. The best athletes in the world do this. They know there's always somebody there better than them. And guess what, the ones who aren't, those are the ones, their life shelf is very short. They come in there arrogant, they stop training, I'm the best in the world, and what happens? One year, two year, you never see them again. They're gone, they're a bust, like they say. Same thing with this dean. You do not want to be that bust. You don't want to think you, you don't have anything to learn. The Prophet wasallam, the best of all kind was guaranteed Jannah, was still staying up all night praying. Why shouldn't we? 
Lastly, consistency. Consistency. Allah likes the ones who are consistent. All the time doing these things consistently. You're not consistent if you're just showing up to the masjid on Eid. That's not consistent. You're not consistent if you're showing up to the masjid only on Fridays. That's not consistent. You're not consistent if you're only donating in Ramadan. What's that? All that is nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. You, you, oh, the ajr is doubled in this time, so let me do it now. The ajr is doubled at this time, let me do it now. You think, hey look, I'm going to find a shortcut. I'm going to find a shortcut to Jannah. And I'll get all these opportunities that I can get these, these things here and there. You know, I, I fasted the 10th Ashura, and that forgives my sins this year and next year. Okay, I can go a whole year with disobeying Allah. No, it doesn't work like that, dear brothers and sisters. Be consistent. Just like working out, you have to stay consistent. You can't work out once a week and expect to be, become a professional athlete. So I ask Allah to make us among the people who are living their life sin-free. I ask Allah to forgive us for our sins. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyin al mursaleen Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid One thing I touched on slightly was being thankful for what Allah has given us I want to start off with a story of a friend, uh, an uncle of a friend of mine This man sent his son to America to study and when he was here in America studying in his dorm room, him and his roommate were playing around with a gun and it went off and he got shot and killed. And he died instantly. When his father overseas heard this news, how did he respond? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. A few years later, during the Arab Spring as they say, in Yemen, his other son was in the house and got hit by a stray bullet and died on the spot. And when his father heard this news, what did he say? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Where did he hear this news? He wasn't there with his son. He was all the way in France doing what? Getting chemotherapy. Why? Because he had cancer. Two of his sons, he outlived two of his sons while he has cancer and he's still saying Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. May Allah grant them all paradise. Amen. Amen. Having shukr, being thankful is one thing we lack. We lack. And I was saying it earlier, we lack this because what? We disobey Allah sometimes. I want to make us among the people who are thankful to Allah. To show we are grateful for what we have. And how do we do that? We help those who are in need. We help those who have less than us. Something happened 21 days ago. And I'm sure you all know of this. And for me, I'll remember it for a while because it's right when I turned 40. The people of Philippines were hit with winds of up to 175 miles per hour. It affected 11.1 million people. I think the stats are 2.2 million people are homeless. Homeless. I remember a few years back, we had three or four days without electricity and people were going crazy. Just electricity, we still had our houses intact. We still had cars. We could go out and still charge our cell phones and call people. These people don't have homes, don't have electricity, and don't have lights and they need our help. And I've heard people say, oh, well, it's not a Muslim country. Do you think you're going to give da'wah to Muslims? No, dear brothers and sisters. This is how you give da'wah. You just help them. You show them you care. The mission is of, of Islam is to help everybody, humanity, when they need our help. Second thing, somebody else came to me and said, oh, the death count is only 5,000 people. 5,000 people. Do you know how much 5,000 people is? It's probably like five times this masjid right now, the attendees of this masjid. 
Think about that, dear brothers and sisters. Sometimes it only takes one person in your life to make that difference. You'll need 5,000 people. And on top of that, we can't really help the people who passed away, can we? No. They return to their Lord. But we can help the people who survived. We can help provide shelter, food, whatever they need for the people who survived. Imagine if you were in that situation. Imagine if you were in that situation. Imagine if you needed our help. So a quick recap. First and foremost, let's change the way we live our life this year. For the people who came, out, came late, we said we decide to live a year of no haram without disobeying Allah. Second thing, let's be thankful, more thankful for what Allah has provided us and how we're going to do that by helping the people in need. Inshallah, after Salah, I'll give you that opportunity. I will give you that opportunity and I only ask for three minutes of your time. Three minutes of your time. Most of you guys have off, you can spare three minutes. <clears throat> oh Allah, I ask you to grant us the good of this world and the good of the life of the hereafter. Keep us and save us from the torment of the hellfire. Oh Allah, do not punish us if we forget. Oh Allah, please do not punish us if we forget. Oh Allah, please save us from the hellfire. Oh Allah, please save us from the hellfire and the punishments of the grave. Oh Allah, please make us among the people of Jannah. Oh Allah, please make us among the people who drink from the prophets of Prophet's hand on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, please save the people who are sick among us. Please Allah, help the people who are suffering around the world, the people in Philippines, the people in Syria, and Egypt, or wherever it may be. Oh Allah, please guide us. Guide us to the right path, and please guide the people around us in the right path. Rabbina atinya fi dunya hasna, wa fil akhirata hasna, wa kina adab al-nar, akkam as-salah.